we humans are fascinated with ourselves. And as a biologist, I'm particularly fascinated with how Darwinian evolution has played a role in shaping our minds and motivations. Today, I'd like to talk about this by exploring a popular slogan. Work hard, play hard. What does it mean? It implies an expected relationship between working hard and playing hard. But why might we expect this? Perhaps we might expect it if playing hard represents a recovery from having to work hard. Or maybe playing hard is a goal that requires working hard in order to achieve or to earn. In other words, maybe some people, many people, work to live and live to play. But we might also reasonably expect a negative trade-off relationship. In other words, more work might leave less time for play, with workaholics at one end and hedonists at the other. Or perhaps their relationship is largely mythical. Is there even any evidence that people who tend to work hard also tend to play hard? I searched everywhere I could think of, but I could find no published data. And so I recently was involved in a survey study together with a student, Laura Crimi, involving a large sample population of Queen's University undergraduate students. Our goal was to test the work hard, play hard hypothesis. In other words, we asked, do indicators of attraction to work correlate with indicators of attraction to play? We measured attraction to work in terms of potential indicators of attraction to accomplishment or fame. We assumed, therefore, that recognition or fame is the principal goal, and that striving for these commonly involves striving for accomplishment of some sort. We asked students, on a scale of one to seven, how important is each of several possible pursuits as a potential life goal, for example, involving success in a reputable career of some sort. We also asked, how many friends do you regularly associate with, and how many Facebook friends do you have? We measured attraction to play in terms of activities that one might pursue for pleasurable free time indulgence. For this, we asked students on a scale of one to seven, how important is each of many pleasurable activities as a source of leisure in your life? For both of these, we collapsed the responses into a single index ranging from zero to one, with all questions weighted equally. And here are the results, showing a very strong and significant positive correlation. Individuals who have high attraction to work also tend to have a relatively high attraction to play or leisure. And so the work hard, play hard phrase is not just mythical or an ideological cliche. It actually exists as a particular pattern of co-variation in motivations, at least for our sample of university students. But the critical question is, why? Why would we expect work hard, play hard to be associated with each other. As a biologist, I'm particularly interested in whether we can understand this work hard, play hard relationship in terms of the evolutionary roots of human motivation. And so what are the main categories of human motivation? These animals are creatures who spend their whole lives just trying to get fed, stay alive, and get laid. That's about it. But that's all they need in order to leave descendants, in other words, for gene transmission success, which is what biologists call evolutionary fitness. And these extinct species of early humans were also probably creatures who spent their whole lives just trying to get fed, stay alive, and mate with each other. And this is certainly true of chimpanzees, our closest living genetic relative in the family of great apes. Survival in sex done well is pretty much all that these animals require in order to transmit successfully 
gene copies into future generations. And of course, our species must also accomplish these in order to leave descendants. But the motivations of modern humans include so much more. As acclaimed philosopher Albert Camus said, we humans are creatures who spend our whole lives trying to convince ourselves that our existence is not absurd. Our species inherited genes from ancestors that gave us an awareness of time, an awareness of self, and an awareness that Others also have self-awareness. This gave us a whole new advanced toolkit for social intelligence on a scale unavailable to other animals. But this self-consciousness also gave us a capacity to foresee our own mortality. A being who knows that he will die arose from ancestors who did not know. Now this might have been all well and fine, but natural selection was not finished. It also gave us an anxiety about this, but not so much about the eventual experience of literal death, but rather it gave us an anxiety about what eventual death imposes, impermanence of the self. Self-impermanence anxiety is about worrying that one's life is absurd, meaningless, pointless, without purpose. It is a fear of not being able to leave something of oneself for the future not just because time brings eventual death, but more importantly because in bringing eventual death, time inevitably annihilates all that we do and all that we are. And so evolution has given us some self-impermanence anxiety buffers involving two main types. And they are represented particularly well in this well-known manifesto for life. Dream as if you'll live forever. Live as if you'll die today. The first of these is just a delusion about being able to leave a legacy, something of oneself that will transcend death. And the second is a distraction provided by leisure, free time indulgence in opportunities for pleasure. And so, we humans have more than just a survival drive and a sex drive. We are also motivated by what I call a legacy drive and a leisure drive. Darwinian evolution, then, I suggest, has shaped our minds with motivations that convince us that our lives have meaning in terms of being able to achieve a sense of self-impermanence. But it has also given us an ability to distract ourselves from the nagging worry that it probably doesn't have self-impermanence. Legacy and leisure drives, then, I suggest, are components of our evolved psychology because our predecessors, who lacked them, generally did not become our ancestors because they were unprotected from the curse of consciousness or self-impermanence anxiety, and so they were less likely to reproduce. And so, play hard, I suggest, is rooted in our deeply ingrained dis disposition to be easily distracted by leisure. And work hard is rooted in our deeply ingrained susceptibility to delusions of legacy, and in, particularly, uh, in particular, legacy through accomplishment. Interestingly, this interpretation of the human condition, driven by intrinsic needs for both delusions and distractions, is echoed in what appears to be the earliest published reference to the work hard, play hard phrase in this book from almost 200 years ago. On page 602, we have, whatever is done should be habitually done with earnestness. In every pursuit, exertion should be employed. Work hard and play hard always recollecting that quiescence, the stillness of inactivity, is destructive to the mental welfare. The work hard, play hard phrase also appears in this 1885 book as part of an advertisement for a religious college in the United States. There it appears as part of a motto involving not just work hard and play hard, 
but also pray hard. And so cultural domains for legacy delusion involve more than just accomplishment. They commonly also involve religion. As philosopher James Feebleman wrote, the human individual knows that he must die, but has thoughts larger than his fate. Religion is an effort to be included in some domain larger and more permanent than mere existence. But the most rudimental delusion for legacy in terms of evolutionary roots is obviously parenthood. As evolutionist Theodosius Dobzhansky wrote, Man has a hope, perhaps an illusory one, that he somehow survives in his descendants. A life devoted to one's family and to one's progeny seems to acquire a meaning. It may be experienced as capturing a particle of an immortality which is beyond the reach of an individual. Other animals have offspring only as an incidental consequence of sex drive. But only humans hope and plan for offspring, and then spend much of their lives seeking pride in them. And so in our survey of uh, university students, we also asked several questions to measure their level of attraction to religion, and also several questions to measure their level of attraction to parenthood. And the result for the relationship between attraction to religion and parenthood also show a strong and significant positive correlation. High attraction to religion was found only when there was also high attraction to parenthood. And low attraction to parenthood was found only when there was also low attraction to religion. And so we have two very strong relationships in our data religion with parenthood, and accomplishment with leisure. But next we wanted to see if we could detect distinct types of individuals based on levels of attraction to all four motivations. For this we used a clustering analysis which shows us the relative similarity of individuals in terms of all four motivations at the same time. And this revealed three general groups or types of individuals and they are particularly conspicuous on our scatter plot for attraction to religion versus parenthood. Shown here with data points plotted using transparency so that data overlap is more evident. So the three groups are low religion combined with low parenthood scores shown in red, high religion combined uh, with high parenthood sh uh, scores shown in green, and low religion combined with high parented scores shown in blue. Now here we distinguish these three groups separately to show where they also fall on the work hard, play hard scale. So the low religion, low parenthood group in red tend to align themselves also with low attraction to both accomplishment and leisure, essentially an apathetic type. And the high religion, high parenthood group in green, or the religious family oriented type, distribute themselves nearly evenly in terms of moderate attraction to both accomplishment and leisure. And finally, the low religion, high parenthood group tend to align themselves with high attraction to both accomplishment and leisure, essentially a secular go-getter, or the work hard, play hard type. And so our analysis suggests that there are two distinct strategies for buffering self and permanence anxiety. The religious family oriented type combines two delusions of legacy, religion and parenthood. And the work hard, play hard type involves distraction through leisure, essentially in place of legacy delusion through religion, but is combined more conspicuously with legacy delusion through accomplishment. But note that both types also have a generally high attraction to parenthood. And I suggest that this indicates that delusion through parenthood is probably the ancestral domain for legacy drive. And that delusion through religion and accomplishment may have evolved later. 
But how do we interpret the apathetic type? With low attraction to everything. Perhaps this might be better described instead as the keep calm and carry on type. This might involve, for example, mindfulness meditation. Although this might also be considered as a distraction through pleasure or leisure of, of a certain kind. And so what type are you? The work hard, or the care, <laughs> The keep calm, carry on type looks pretty attractive, actually, but it doesn't describe me. I kind of wish it did. Or perhaps you are the pray hard and breed hard type. <laughs> or perhaps you are the work hard, play hard type. Now, both of these types, uh, in my view, Need, will need especially to be managed more carefully now that our species has become too successful. There are too many of us now, and we're trashing the planet. Our lives resemble the lives of chimps more than any other animal. They have a rudimental theory of mind and a capacity for culture through social learning across generations. But chimps live in a world as they find it. Humans, however, live in a world as they make it. And we have made it mostly a world of delusions for chasing legacy, commonly through working hard. And a world of distractions for chasing leisure, commonly through playing hard. And this has made a world that is annihilating other species at a rate never seen before in the history of life and a civilization that is unsustainable for our species. And so this is the central problem of what we are. Most of us are attracted instinctively to delusions and distractions of one kind or another. As poet T.S. Eliot mused, humankind cannot bear very much reality. This does not bode well in terms of our being equipped to respond effectively to a collapsing civilization. The good news is that cultural evolution could come to our rescue, but I think it will need to be better informed with what it needs in order to promote the positive consequences and to manage the negative consequences of our biological evolution. And this will require having a much deeper and more broadly public understanding of what we are and how we got that way. Thank you.